This video talks about the neurobiology of learning. Learning is the acquisition of new knowledge, while memory is the retention of learned information. Neurogenesis is the creation of new neurons. There are two forms of neurogenesis. The first form is embryonic or pluripotential stem cells that form from the blastocyst, and these create new neurons. And the second form of neurogenesis is neural stem cells, which has sub-epidemal of the ventricles. These create constitutively proliferating cells, or CP cells. They migrate out depending on uh, BDNF, or brain-derived neurotropic factors, and as a result, influences growth uh, in the brain. The opposite of neurogenesis is neurodegeneration, which is the death of neurons and or the rearrangement of neurons. Exercise and neurogenesis. Exercise appears to be very important in learning, in enhancing learning and neurogenesis in the hippocampus, and it may protect against dementia and cognitive decline. Also, that could be possibly due to environmental enrichment because you're moving around and you're seeing new places which then help to stimulate the brain to make new connections. Thus, exercise is important for neurogenesis. Also, dendritic branching is driven by experience. Dendrites grow when learning new skills takes place and synaptic elimination or pruning uh, occurs when new skills or experiences are forgotten or not used. And experiences are forgotten. Dendritic pruning occurs because you don't use it. So if you don't use it, you lose it. The experience, or experience and cortical reorganization the cortex changes in order to accommodate for motor activity that is used or needed. So, for example, those people who play the piano, their fingers in the sensorimotor homunculus or representation is much larger in the brain. It takes into account for the skill of knowing how to play the piano and aplesia is a snail that researchers have used profoundly due to its uh, habituation in the gill reflex. It was found that simple neurons grew and changed and prove the existence of neuroplasticity. Aplesia's neurons are quite simple and quite large. So as a result, we can see the effects of uh, how learning takes place, of course, through habituation. Now, specificity of synaptic connections according to Hebb's theory is whereby when certain connections are used more, they become stronger. Neural representations of objects are activated by external stimuli and some cortical cells activate simultaneously when exposed to the stimuli. There is also the idea of synaptic cooperativity, which is how two strong stimuli are linked in neural circuits. The more efficient a circuit, the more that it becomes dedicated to linking the association. This is paired via repeated exposure of EPSPs for excitatory postsynaptic potentials. Synaptic associativity is the notion of weak stimuli becoming uh, subsequently stronger in their association. Successful pairings uh, must occur at 50 ms. Long-term potentiation strengthens synapses. It is a brief high-frequency EPSP that occurs around 50 to 100 hertz, and it is also long-lasting. How long-term potentiation works is through the release of action potentials, which releases glutamate that binds to AMPA receptors and lets in Na2+. This produces large EPSPs, or excitatory postsynaptic potentials, and uh, releases the magnesium plugs in the AMPA receptors, which have a positive charge. And since the EPSPs are also positive, it repels the magnesium away, so that's opening the plug and causes more calcium to come in. Strong calcium ions causes the enzyme protein kinase C and CAM K2 to drive receptors to membranes and make the signal more stronger. This increases AMPA sensitivity and the number of receptors increases. You need a 50 ms action potential as stated earlier or the whole process would revert. And yeah, all of these uh, occur very quickly. Anyway, long-term depression is the opposite of long-term potentiation whereby long-term depression weakens synaptic connections and have brief low-frequency excitatory postsynaptic potentials, EPSPs, which weaken the strength of the synapses. Small action potentials in the postsynaptic axon release few glutamate, which causes small numbers of AMPA receptors to bind, and as a result releases few magnesium ions and few calcium ions come in. As a result of this, this activates phosphatase, which stops AMPA receptors from working and also causes receptors to come into the cell, thus overall weakening the signal. Moving along, glutamate receptors uh, require the binding of glutamate onto it, and there are ionotropic receptors which affect NMDA, AMPA, and kinate receptors, and there are also met metabotropic receptors which affects M, GLU, R1 to R, receptor 1 to receptor 7. And these are second messenger systems. BCM theory was proposed by Vienestock, Cooper, and Monroe, which talks about a bidirectional regulation of synaptic strength up and down. Uh, the system which causes activity cells to weakly depolarize or LTD, long-term depression. Memory is caused by the release of calcium ions in the synapses and these react to the second messenger systems which may either weaken or strengthen the condition. In summary, we looked at learning, memory, neurogenesis, neurodegeneration, the effects of exercise on neurogenesis, uh, we defined dendritic pruning and dendritic branching, cortical reorganization, the use of aplesia, 
uh, Hebb's theory of specificity of synaptic connections, synaptic cooperativity, synaptic associativity. We define the long-term potentiation and long-term depression and how it works. And we also looked at BCM theory and how glutamate receptors or the different types of glutamate receptors. So yeah, thanks for watching. This is the neurobiology of learning and memory. Thanks.